Well, good morning and welcome to Croydon Hills Baptist Church Online. My name's Ben and it's great to be able to join with you this morning. As part of our service today, we're going to have a chat function that runs. We'd like to invite everyone to share their name in that and who they're meeting with because we know that there are some families who are gathering together for the service today. Also, as part of our service, if you don't want to see that chat function, you can watch the video only. There'll be a link that you can click in the description and they'll take you to that video. So it'd be great if we can all join together now as we worship God this morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Croydon Hills Baptist Online. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning. We're really glad to have you with us today. We're going to sing some songs together now. So I invite you, if you feel comfortable, to stand up to join us as we sing. And let's worship together. Changes that 
is gone I won't be afraid You are with me always Huge when the walls have fallen around me I am safe in the valley Lord you are near always when the waters rise around Jesus, we thank you for your presence with us today. And God, we all find ourselves in such different places right now in our life. And God, I pray that as we meet together online this morning, that we would sense your presence and know, Lord, that you are guiding us through this crazy season of life. Lord, we welcome you into our homes today. And we pray that you would come and your presence would flood our hearts. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare your living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone.
There's nothing. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're a living hope. Your presence. Tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit. Welcome again to Croydon Hills Baptist Church Online. It's great that you're able to join with us this morning and we're able to worship God together. I've just got a couple of quick announcements that I'd like to share with you about things that are going on in the life of the church. Firstly, on Wednesday night at 7.30, we have our weekly prayer meeting. I'd like to encourage everyone to participate in that because it's a great way that we can encourage one another and support one another as we're separated. We can view that at chbc.org.au forward slash live. 
Also on Friday night, we've got our Real Youth TV program for all the youth in our community. That happens at realyouth.chbc.org.au. So if you know any youth, can you please encourage them to join in and connect together through this program. Kids, CHBC Kids is kicking off very soon. So if you like to get your iPads or your devices ready to tune in, it's gonna be a whole bunch of fun for those guys as they tune into that this morning. And also we've got our giving time now. So if you like to prepare for that and wanna participate in that, all those funds go towards supporting our community at this time. The details will be listed below and it'll be great if we can participate in that and support what God is doing through our community. And after the time of giving, we're going to hear some stories from our next gen community about what God is doing at the moment. coming to you live from our CHBC Kids set. You know, we've had such an amazing time learning how to do ministry in this new season. Every Sunday morning, one of the ways we do this is we go live with our CHBC Kids program. This is a great space for us to be able to worship and jump into a story and even learn a memory verse for the, with the kids, just like we would if they were here at Rock and Lighthouse. One of the other things that we've been doing is connecting and engaging with our families on our kids' Facebook page. This has been a great space to give the kids some creative challenges to connect with them during the week. And Brick Dad has been giving out some fantastically creative Lego challenges as well. One of my personal highlights has been connecting every second Thursday night with our families over Zoom. This is a great space where we all join together for an hour or so and do an amazing fun family games night. But it's all good. The fun is not over yet. And we would love it if you would like to join in with us as well. If you have any questions or anything like that, please don't hesi hesitate to contact me anytime. But now I'm gonna pass over to Matt. Hey guys, how are you? Welcome to our Real Youth Set. This is where we do Real Youth Live on a Friday night at eight o'clock every Friday night. And it is so much fun. I wish you could be here to just see the craziness that is going on here. Um, you know, we really care about the kids and the young people at Croydon Hills and whatever we can do to be serving them and ministering to them over this period, we've been doing, so we have leaders who are doing things that they have never done before. They're going live, not pre-recorded, but actually live in front of a camera, straight out to the kids. Um, it's just been a great ball of fun that we've really enjoyed. Uh, we don't just do Friday nights, we also do um, small groups on a Tuesday night and we have other small groups running on other nights as well. And they're all done over Zoom, so that's a real challenge for some of our leaders to create that inclusive, welcoming, discipling environment online. But you know, um, our leaders have done an incredible job jumping in and giving that their best. It's been really, really amazing. Um, we've loved to be able to serve the church in this way and I want to encourage you to keep on praying for our young people, for our kids, our youth and our young adults. Um, and right now we're going to show you a video so you get to see a little bit of what we do.
This week, we wanted to spend some time uh, encouraging and praying for those who are involved in, in schools. Particularly, we want to pray for teachers and for those uh, parents who are thrust into the role of being teachers. And we thought it'd be great at this time to have a chat with a, a member of our church community who's also a teacher. And so I want to I want to welcome Wayne today. It's great to have you along to have a chat with me, Wayne. Sure, I'm pleased to be here. So Wayne, could you maybe tell us a little bit about uh, what you teach and uh, what year level whereabouts? Sure, I'm at Mount Evelyn Christian School. I've just started here um, this year. Um, so it's been an interesting um, couple of months, really, couple of terms. Um, I teach middle primary, so that's grade three and four. All right, fantastic. Now, obviously, the, the changes through the COVID virus have been dramatic in all areas of life, but none more so than in the, uh, the teaching profession. Can you maybe explain to us how, how some of the changes have been and how they've impacted your work environment? Yeah, sure. So we, we uh, finished up here um, the, the last week of, of Term 1. Um, and like everyone else, um, it was remote learning from then. Um, so it, it's been um, really interesting. So how do you find that communicating with the students who are remote learning and the parents at the moment? Yeah, I, I think um, it, it's, it's been a, a hard change, a difficult one, um, because um, you have to let go of the expectation of academics uh, to a certain extent, because you can't uh, keep a handle on their learning. Um, one of the things I think um, we have learned as teachers is that well-being is probably the most important thing. So as long as we keep connected to our students and we do that through uh, something like Zoom, uh, and we do that on a daily basis and we catch up with devotions once a week. Um, so that staying connected is probably the most important thing. I imagine with all the changes, the numbers of the students and their families are feeling very stressful uh, in that type of environment. How are you as a teacher uh, understanding and helping to, to deal with that and coping with that stress? Um, yeah, I guess uh, we've had some uh, families and, and parents who uh, have felt really hard done by and uh, finding it really hard to cope, especially those families who have um, younger children and who have children with disabilities, um, those who um, have large families especially, they found it really hard. So I've had a number of chats with those parents. It's um, listening to them. Uh, it's um, uh, working out something that will work with their, with their children learning. It might be something like um, not doing a lot of work at all. It might be just hanging out as a family or um, working at something in the backyard or playing a game or just going for a bike ride as a family. So, yeah, working out those issues that, that come up uh, because, yeah, parents are doing it tough. Um, yeah, they're finding it pretty tough to to do homeschool and we keep on saying that it's not actually homeschool that it's actually remote learning there is a difference so you know we keep on reassuring parents you're not there to teach your, your children um, you're there just to help them along the way there's a fine difference between the two i know uh, but we're trying to not put too much pressure on them mm. that must require uh, an awful amount of flexibility and adaptability on behalf of the teachers and and i imagine there are a lot of times when the teachers, yourself, and your colleagues feel a lot under pressure. How are you? How are you personally coping with the stress? Look, I think um, it could end up being a twenty-four-seven job because you go home, and if you've been in the hub during the day with the essential services kids, then you go home and catch up with emails. I think you just got to put limits on what you can do. Um, go home, take a break, not look at any emails. Um, and look after your own family. You know, we most, uh, a lot of uh, teachers have families at home as well and kids who are, are at home doing remote learning. So making sure that your own family is looked after is, is pretty important too. Yeah, that's some really helpful insight, Wayne. I suppose the final thing I want to ask you today 
is, is how can we as a church community be praying for you and supporting you, not only yourself personally, but all other people who are involved in, in schools? Sure. I, I guess um, we are blessed enough to, to be in a, a Christian school here, and we actually have devotions as a class once a week where we pray for each other. Um, in, in terms of other people praying for us and the congregation praying for us, I think wisdom, knowing the pathway forwards now that uh, uh, students are now coming back into schools in the next couple of weeks, um, knowing what to say to anxious children when they come to school. Um, yeah, some might be really worried about uh, uh, what might happen um, and to their parents as, as well. And just realising too that God is in control and knowing that um, uh, we can pray for protection. Uh, we can pray that uh, God, we know that God is in charge and that he will look after us. Mm, fantastic. Uh, that's some really helpful things, Wayne. And, uh, and I want to say to you personally, but also to, to everybody else who's a part of uh, the teaching profession and school environments, how much we appreciate all the work and, and the flexibility, the changeability, like you said, the understanding and empathy for families and for children that for everybody in the teaching profession is going on. We thank you so much for all that you're doing and that we'll continue to pray and support you however we can. So thank you so much for being with us today, Wayne. Thanks, Andrew, and appreciate the time. We're going to enter into a time of prayer together this morning. As we go through this, I'm going to lead us in a time and invite you to participate in your own homes and to pray uh, with the people that are there with you. Let's pray together. From Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through generations. Father God, we want to praise you this morning. Uh, we want to declare that your name is higher and above all other names in our world. Father, we come before you this morning with praise. Father, we know that there are many people in our communities that are suffering and questioning things at this time. We want to lift them up before you this morning. There are many people who are sick and isolated. I'm going to invite us all to think of these people in our own homes now and to bring them before God. And Father, we also want to pray for our leaders at this time, our government leaders and our leaders in our community. For, we want to lift them up as they seek to guide us to make decisions that affect us all. We uphold them in prayer this morning. We pray for wisdom for them. And we pray that they can be leading with an example that you are putting on their hearts. That the decisions that they can make will reflect your heart for our community. I invite us all to name some of the leaders in our community at this time and lift them up in prayer. Father, I want to give thanks for our frontline workers, those people who are serving in our hospitals and our shops, those people who are caring for those who are in need and sick. Father, we pray your protection over them this morning, that you'll keep them well, that you'd encourage them when they're feeling stressed and worn out, and you'd be giving them great discernment as they also make decisions that hold people's lives in the balance. And this morning, we'd like to lift them up to you and invite everyone in their own homes to name some people that they know who are frontline workers who are doing it tough at this time. And finally, Father, we want to pray for those in our community who do not know you, who are asking questions and seeking answers in this time that are... Uh, us as a church can be a source of encouragement that they, we can witness for you, that we can point people towards you. 
that we can find ways to come alongside them, encourage them, and that they, over this period, can come to know you. They'll know the saving work of Jesus and that he would come in and bring hope and joy and peace to them in this season. So I'll lift these people up to you this morning, who are our neighbours, who are our friends, who are our family, and pray for opportunities to share the truth that you've worked in our lives with them. May you continue to reveal yourself and bless our communities over this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we're reading from Mark chapter 1, verses 16 to 20. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat, repairing their nets. He called to them at once, and they also followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. It's great to have you join us again today. It's only, it's only three weeks until the footy restarts. So who's, who's ready to see the footy start again? Leah is, I know she's mad keen because she's waiting to see the Tigers fall in a, in a screaming heap this year. We've had enough of Richmond on top. We've had enough of Collingwood sort of being in our faces. We want to see some real teams win. I know I'm looking forward to seeing the Hawks. It's been a dry couple of years. We've only won three premierships in the last 10, so it's, it's been a hard time for us Hawthorne supporters. We're ready to see those bodies collide. We're ready to cheer for our team and sing this song and and support the players that we love. Let me ask you a question here today. How did you choose to follow the club that you barrack for? How did you choose? Oh, many of us, I suspect, uh, we had a team kind of foisted upon us. We didn't really have a say in it. You know, we were given a jumper, taken to a game, and that was all she wrote. I tried that process with my oldest daughter, Lauren. Uh, in fact, I've got a photo of her when she's only four, four days old with a Hawthorne beanie sitting down on my knee watching a Hawthorne Melbourne game. And I tried to get her to see the light, to see what it would be like to support a club with values, a club with success, a club with honour. But sadly, I've got to say, sadly my, my heart was broken only six years later when she came to me one day and she told me, Dad, I'm not going to be barracking for the Hawks anymore. And you know the reason that she told me? She said, Dad, I'm not going to be barracking for the Hawks anymore because Hawks, the bird, the Hawks, uh, they're predators. They are, they are predators of my favourite animal, the pygmy marmoset. And I can't barrack for a football club. I can't barrack for the Hawks that would attack the magnificent pygmy marmosets. Now, I've got to say, between my tears... I wanted to say, who cares about pygmy marmosets? They're only these tiny little animals anyway, and they're just clogging up the jungle. What we need to do is have the hawks. You know, some people, some people barrack for a team because they like the colours. Uh, my little sister, she used to barrack for the hawks because when she went to primary school, they put down the colours of the football teams, and she liked the colours of, of chocolate and gold, not some alternative description, she liked the colours of chocolate and gold on the blackboard. Of course, it wasn't very effective. A few years later, she soon fell out of love with that fashion style and chose to barrack for another team. Or maybe for some of you, you grew up in a, maybe in a non-AFL state or in a different country, and when you came to Victoria or some other AFL place, you had a team that was you were encouraged to. Maybe you met a, a work colleague or a friend and they said to you, you've got a barrack for my team. Maybe that happened to you. You know, I follow the Hawks because when I was a young kid, maybe like six or seven years old, I was at an athletics carnival. And at this athletics carnival, we're all gathered together at a, at a training centre, I think it was in Caulfield, and we had a special guest on that day, and the special guest was David Parkin, the captain of the Hawthorne Football Club at the time. And I thought, this sounds like a great club to barrack for. Uh, but the truth is what really cemented my love for the Hawks was this man. Yeah, you know that man. The greatest footballer ever. 
He cemented my love for the Hawks because he was so good. And not only that, he also used to own a sports store that was about 10 minutes from where I lived. And so sometimes when you dropped into that sports store, you could actually see him there. We all have different reasons, don't we, as to why we follow or why we barrack for a team. Think about something maybe even of the music that you like or the bands that you follow. Some of us probably um, follow a band because we simply love the music. You know, it kind of triggers something within us and we go, I love that music. But for many others, the reasons are kind of far more complex. Maybe your parents used to love to play some music again and again. And for some of you, that's probably made you go, oh, that's a part of my childhood. I love that music. For some of you, it might have caused you to kind of repulse away from and say, oh, I don't want to hear that again. I know that, that my wife, Narelle, she grew up in the country and she does not like country music. But for many of us, a style or a music was, was kind of something we inherited from our older siblings. Uh, I have an older sister and uh, my, my younger brothers and I, we used to listen to ABBA all the time. The only difference, of course, is that we used to play it on 45 so that they sounded like the chipmunks, not like the regular ABBA. And if you don't understand that story, you need to ask your parents to explain it to you. For some others, our, our music preferences, what we follow, what we like, is influenced by our friends. Uh, some of you know I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the boss, Bruce Springsteen. And I think the reason for that is, apart from the great lyrical content and musicality, I think the reason is because I had an older mate of mine who used to play it in his car all the time, and so I used to listen to it again and again. You know, there are many reasons why we choose to follow. In Mark chapter 1, we read this, that one day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, that's Peter, and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. And Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little further up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. And he called them at once. And they also followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. Uh, this passage records the, the first interaction that Jesus has with those people who will be his followers. They will be with him for the next three years of his life. It's not set in the midst of a, um, an incredible miracle. There's not a mass gathering of a crowd as Jesus preaches and gets them. No, we read this interaction between Jesus and these four men on the shores of Galilee as they go about their everyday work. Here's Jesus, not long after he's been baptised by John and spent some time in the, in the desert, and he comes to them and he says, Come and follow me. It seems that we know that, that the four of them probably knew Jesus a little bit beforehand. Uh, you can read a little bit about some of their early interactions in John chapter 1 if you want to read about that. And it kind of makes some sense because it would seem sort of strange that out of the blue, if Jesus just bumped into four people beside this, the Sea of Galilee and he said, come and follow me and they didn't know anything about him at all. No, it seems like Jesus actually knows them a little bit. But really, I think the reality is, is that they didn't know him completely or as well as they would in the future. I wonder what the first thoughts that went through their head were at this time. I know what I think the first thoughts that would go through my head, and they wouldn't be, I'm at once going to drop everything that I have and go and follow these men. No, my, my mind would be filled, probably the same as yours, filled with all sorts of questions and complaints. Jesus, wait a sec, there are a lot of things that I don't know about you, isn't it a little bit unrealistic that I would come and follow you? I mean, where are you going? if I'm coming to follow? Uh, how much is it going to cost me to sign up to this crusade? Uh, hold on for a second, Jesus. I, I've got all these other plans in my life. I mean, what about my family? Uh, what about my, my friends? What about my, my girl, my livelihood, my future? Uh, what, what about all those sorts of things? I wonder what questions that you would ask. Uh, I expect that like me, 
that your head would be filled with questions and you'd have kind of a furrowed brow. Think about what the questions the four men who were called in this instance, for James and John, for Simon, Peter and Andrew, I wonder what they might have thought. Jesus, I've got some, I've got some excuses, some reasons why I can't really quite join you at this stage. What you're asking me is just too costly. You're asking me, if I get this right, you're asking me to leave everything behind. Everything I love. My family? You're asking me to abandon my parents? That's not right. You're asking me to leave my home? Uh, It's too costly. It's too financially painful. You're asking me to leave my job, my living behind. Uh, That's my security. You're asking me to abandon everything that I hold dear. You're asking me to leave my identity behind. No, 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 Jesus, it's, it's too costly. Or, or maybe they were, they were able to ask the same question that I wanted to ask. Where are you going? I mean, if you're asking me to follow you, are you asking me just to follow you for today? For the next month, the next week? Uh, is it just for a short time or a long time? Are, are we staying local? I mean, I know this area, Jesus. I know the people around it. I know where to get a good kebab. Uh, if we don't travel too far, at least I'll be able to go and see my friends and my family on the weekend. I have so many questions, but where are we going? I might begin to answer some of them. Maybe they thought this. Uh, Jesus, I, um, I hear that you want some people to join you, but I'm really not too qualified. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not good enough. I mean, Andrew and, and Peter and, and James and John, they were fishermen. And they were kind of skilled labourers. It appears that they were... They had some techniques, they knew where to fish, they knew how to handle a boat, though you know, over the next couple of chapters we'll see some things which will ask us some questions about that. But they weren't really qualified in any bigger scale. I mean, in ancient times, if someone wanted to follow a, a rabbi, follow a teacher, in some way similar to what Jesus is talking about, they were expected to have some knowledge of the Torah, almost like they could pass a preliminary theological examination. For Peter and, and Andrew and James and John, maybe I'm just not qualified enough. Ultimately, I think that the question that would go through their head the most is this. Is, is do I know enough about you, Jesus? Uh, what I think that really means is, do I know enough about you to trust you with everything that you're asking? I mean, how much did they really know? A little bit. But I'm sure they had plenty of questions and and wanted more answers. I think they would have been frightened. I'd be frightened. I imagine you would be too. You know, the questions, in fact, of who this Jesus really is will begin to get answered very soon. In dramatic ways, Jesus will demonstrate his power Power over evil, power over over nature, over sin, over physical things in this world, and people will be amazed. But right now, they're only at kind of step one. They're kind of at come and see. They don't really know what fills in the picture. The truth is, you know, that for all of us, it doesn't matter who you are, you're going to have that sort of feeling at some point in time in your life. We all make decisions without a full lot of information, without the the future being certain, without a full knowledge of everything with regards to our our careers, our jobs, our spouses, where we will live. They all have these elements of a mysterious jump in them. You think about it is what it is for someone to get married. I mean, they walk down an aisle, but they don't really know where that aisle will lead. Uh, we know someone a bit. You know, when you get married, you, you, I expect you should know someone a bit. It's not sort of a, an arranged marriage normally. But the truth is we don't know where life will go. We don't have those guarantees, do we? So how do we make that decision? You see, ultimately, we have to have, we have, to have trust in the one that we love, in the person that we know, 
greater than the fear of where that might go, greater than the fear of the unknown. To follow Jesus is always going to entail risk because, because faith is an act and then the details of life start to get filled in. And in fact, the truth is it's only in the act of faith that we begin to fully understand who Jesus is. The disciples at this stage have no idea where the journey goes, but they just have to trust the king. They have to trust the one who has authority, the one who cared, the one who loved them. So why do they respond to the call? Why does it say in that text that they left their their nets, their, their life, their livelihood immediately at once and followed him? The thing I love about what we read in this is this, is that the reasons for them to follow Jesus are bigger than the reasons for them to stay behind. I think the first reason that they begin to follow Jesus is simply this, is because Jesus comes calling. Jesus searches for them. They don't go to the temple and meet him there. No, he comes to them. God meets them in the working world of the Sea of Galilee, in the place where they got their hands dirty, in the place where they repaired their nets, in the place which smelt. You see, that's the action of a God of love that reaches out. That's the action of of a God of love who goes to the outer circle, the one who doesn't just stay in the safe place but reaches out to all. And Jesus reaches out to them. He comes calling to them. And I think that's critical to them. The second thing I want to say is that not only does he reach out to them, he calls them to something, something which is far greater in life. You see, he's not just calling them away from being a fisherman. No, he's calling them to a greater purpose in life. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You know, I think that we all aspire to something that's significant in life, don't we? You know, sometimes in our lives we try to fill up the empty spaces with things which have empty meanings and they leave us unsurprisingly empty. We all want our lives to count for something, to make a difference. And you see, Jesus is not only calling them to follow him, he's calling them to a greater purpose in their life, to help to bring about the kingdom of God because followers of Jesus are called to help to bring about the kingdom of God. Followers of Jesus are called to be servants in this greater purpose. This service is costly. The fishermen, they leave their nets behind. They leave their families behind, not because there's anything wrong with fishing nets, not because there's anything wrong with families. No, the reason is, is because that anything that gets in the way of the kingdom of God must be left behind. Anything that, that weighs us down must be shed. This is the greater purpose that Jesus is calling us to. Uh, you know, the process of becoming a follower of Jesus is not an instant one. It's not a silver bullet You can't just buy it off a shop. No, the the followers of Jesus, the disciples at this stage, they obey him at once today. But then again, over the next years, again and again, they will choose to follow Jesus. See, that's the way faith comes. It doesn't come in a single jump. It comes day by day, bit by bit. And in the process of that, that helps us to be a part of this greater calling and purpose. You see, Jesus calls us, who we are, where we are right now. He calls us with our our strengths and our weaknesses. He calls us in the midst of whether we're a a teacher, a, a mechanic, a homemaker, an executive, a student. He calls us whether we're an extrovert, an introvert, whether we're emotional or whether we're logical, whether we love music or we love sport. He calls us just with whoever we are, wherever we are. You know, too often, too often we, we cloud up what it, is called to, what it is to be called a follower of Jesus. Uh, we clog that idea up with, with religious language and ceremony. 
We, fa we, re we fail to remember that Jesus calls us who we are and where we are to this greater purpose. And Jesus calls those four fishermen from the Sea of Galilee to this greater purpose. A final thing that I think that is, in reality, the most significant about the call of Jesus on these men's lives is this, is that Jesus is the one who has authority to call them. Because Jesus is the king. Uh, all the other reasons are, are valid and significant, but they are secondary to this main point. Because Jesus has authority. Soon his followers will see and experience that authority. And Jesus calls them with divine authority, calls them to be his, his disciples. Come and follow me. He doesn't say, come and walk in the ways of God. And that's the way in which the, the prophets of the Old Testament would call people. He doesn't say, come and live by the Torah, the Jewish religious law. No, no, Jesus is is completely different than those, those teachers of the past and those who we be compared with in that current day. Jesus says, come and follow me. That's completely different from the other rabbis and scribes of Judaism. There are no other stories which are well, like that calling. Rabbis did not consummate a, a teacher-student relationship by this call of follow me. No, they would say, learn the Torah from me but never follow me. You see, Jesus calls to follow him because he is divine. He is the king and he has that authority to call. The call to these four fishermen is not rooted in the law of the Torah. No, it's rooted in Jesus' messianic authority. It doesn't need debates it doesn't need miracles or moral persuasion. It comes because when the godly king calls, we respond. We respond and then to leave everything behind only seems too logical because we're being called by the greatest. And there's only one thing that the fishermen can do is leave everything behind and come and follow the king. You know, last week we spoke about how Mark had made this announcement of good news about how Jesus is the Messiah, the King, the Anointed One. And now that King calls us to come and follow him. At this time, the disciples had no idea where that was going. They just have to trust the King. They just have to trust the one who has authority. They just have to trust the one who is the Lord of love and Prince of peace. The one who can heal and teach and guide. They just have to trust him. And you know, that same Jesus calls us to trust him. He calls us from the, from the seas of Galilee, so to speak, from our workplaces, from our schools, from our homes, our neighbourhoods. He calls us to come and follow him. He calls us to come and follow him at one stage in our life and he calls us again and again and again. It's almost like every day that we wake up, we, we answer that question again, come and follow me, and we choose to do that that day. I, I want to ask you a question today. Have you ever, like Andrew and Peter, drop your nets and follow Jesus? I'm going to ask you to do something today for me, in fact. If you're on the, on the chat part of our, um, of our broadcast today, I would love you to just start down there and say, I began to follow Jesus, fill in the gaps. If it was me, I would say, I began to follow Jesus really in 1983. That's all you need to drop down. I'd love you to do that today. You know, for many of us, I think, for many of us, I think that there's a part of us that wants to, to follow Jesus, but we are, we're fearful. We make up excuses like I all too easily articulated beforehand. It's kind of like we're, um, 
We want to see, we, you know, we see one of those, those diving towers and we, and we see it there and we want to jump off it. And go, that would be fantastic to be able to do. But I'm just a wee bit frightened. And so maybe we convince ourselves, I'll oh, just give it a try. I'll, I'll just... So we start to climb up the ladder up the side of the dive tower. And maybe we get halfway and we go, no, nah, it's getting a bit high and we start to back down again. Or maybe we climb to the top of the tower. We stand up there on the platform. I'm not quite sure if I can do it or not. Maybe slowly we begin to kind of like, um, to edge our way to the, to the edge of the platform. Maybe we even kind of sit down because we wouldn't want to fall over accidentally or we just kind of peer our head over the side. You know, I want to encourage you today that when it comes to following Jesus, there comes a point when we have to jump off the edge, when we have to abandon, in a sense, the, the safety of the things that we hold onto, the, the diving platform, the ladder. We have to abandon them. We have to leave them behind. The difference is this. To jump off a diving platform, it's sensible to have fear. It's a long way down. 10 metres is a decent a decent distance to jump off. And let me tell you that when you hit the water, uh, the water's pretty hard. It's sensible to have fear. The difference is I want to say to you is this, is that when we're called to follow Jesus, it is a jump into the unknown. But what can give us confidence is that we are being called by the Lord of love and Prince of Peace. And as much as he calls us into the unknown to follow him, he calls us to walk with him along that journey. And that gives us courage and strength to overcome any fear that we might have. To overcome our excuses, to overcome our reasons to say no, and to drop everything at once and come follow him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the truth that you are in Jesus, the one who reaches out to each one of us and calls us. You call us where we are right now to come and follow you. And our God, you know our excuses. You know our fears. Father, today I pray that your spirit would overwhelm each person listening so much that they would have no choice but to come and follow you. Father, I pray that we would, we would be reminded and understand the truth of who you are, the messianic king, the one who is the God of love, and that you call us to come and follow you today. Father, give us the courage to do so that we might walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus, you are mercy. Jesus, you are justice. Jesus, you are worthy. What you are, you died alone to save me, you rose so you could raise me, you did this all to make me a chosen child of God. Worthy is the Lamb that once was slain. To So you could raise me, you did this.
Thank you for joining with us this morning. It's been a great time that we've been able to gather together to continue through the book of Mark. Just a reminder that we've also got a reading guide that goes through this series and they'll be listed below if you haven't already downloaded that. Also this morning, if you'd like prayer for any needs, please click on the prayer button and you'll be able to connect with one of our pastoral team and they'll be able to pray with you this morning. God bless and we pray that you have a great week.